and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, St. Paul speaks of the importance of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, When I came to you, brothers, I did not proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. By his death on the cross, our Lord Jesus won salvation for us. It is fitting that this new cross be sanctified by the word of God and prayer for our devotion and as a proclamation of his atoning work for us. This new processional crucifix was donated by the men's confession study in honor of the 10th anniversary of my ordination into the holy ministry this past June. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all, that he might bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our eyes may ever behold our Savior and his cross, that we may not fear the power of any adversaries, but rather rejoice in his victory for us. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless this cross. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, the poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever been you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your countless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Do not forget the clamor of your foes. of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Let the poor and needy praise your name.
Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Do not forget the clamor of your foes. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us to love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Trinity is from 2 Chronicles, chapter 28. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded, and he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves." 
Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me. Send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken. For the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Certain chiefs also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshillamoth, Jehizekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadlai, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is a fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name rose and took the captives, and with the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, And anointed them, and carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. The epistle is from Galatians chapter 3. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, 
and did not hear it. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, God
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, today in the 10th chapter of Luke, we hear quite a familiar tale, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Even non-Christians know the phrase, a Good Samaritan. Now, for as familiar as this story might be to us and to the world, I don't know if we often consider just where in the Gospel of Luke this parable shows up. What's the context in which Jesus tells us this parable? You see, Jesus is on the move. His face is set toward Jerusalem, and he's intent on doing his Father's will. As he journeys on for the next 14 chapters of the Gospel, Jesus' work is primarily focused on fundamentally altering the way, in pe- the way in which people view the world. He's turning over apple carts, you might say. And that's exactly the focus of the parable of the Good Samaritan. This parable, it portrays Jesus' preaching in a nutshell. Woe to the mighty, but mercy to the weak. You see, the winds have shifted, the tides have changed, the Christ has come. No longer will anybody be able to stand before God, boasting of their own righteousness, of their own goodness. And so Jesus sends out his 72 disciples as harbingers of this, preaching the word before him. They cast out demons, they heal the sick, they go to the weak. And Jesus has been given authority over all things by the Father in heaven. All things have been handed over to the God-man, Jesus Christ. And the glory of God is being revealed through him, even to little children. But it is being hidden from the wise and the mighty and the understanding. Now, speaking of the wise and the understanding, in walks a lawyer A man seeking to put Jesus to the test. Now, don't think of law and order reruns or Atticus Finch or something like that. This is not a trial lawyer or a courtroom lawyer, not a lawyer joke lawyer. He is an expert in the law of God. He's a scholar of the scriptures. He is like the man in Psalm 1, well, at least on paper, who upon the law of the Lord he meditates day and night. But Jesus reveals to us in the gospel why lawyers like these study the law. They're not earnestly seeking the salvation of God. They're not looking for mercy for their sins. Instead, they study the law of the Lord in order to divide the world into two camps in order to divide themselves from their neighbor, in order to say, I am here, you are there, get away from me. The lawyers are the ones, as we'll find out in the next chapter of Luke, who heap up large burdens upon people, but they don't lift one finger to help. They are the ones who dangle eternal life in front of the eyes of people and say, okay, jump a little higher, Reach a little higher, try a little harder, you might just get it. And this is obvious that this is the case from the lawyer's question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? No, notice, he's not super concerned with what his neighbor does. It's, what must I do? Tell me I'm good enough, Jesus. You see, to them, the law of God is merely a list of rules, and all these rules do is divide the in crowd from the out crowd. And so the lawyer wants to know, is Jesus in or is he out? Is he one of the cool kids? Is he going to maintain the status quo? Is he here to join the establishment? Well, you remember those apple carts I was talking about? The lawyer is about to find out that he's sitting squarely on top of one. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Just keep the law perfectly. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. No problem. Just do this and you'll live. Now, you know, in a sense, they're not wrong here, neither the lawyer nor Jesus, because God is just. He will not put to death somebody who keeps the law perfectly, but that's not the problem. That's not the right question. It's just as St. Paul teaches us in the epistle lesson from Galatians today, that this was never why God gave the law. For if a law, St. Paul writes, had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. God never intended to attach eternal life to your own works and your own merit and your own righteousness. The law was never given as a life-giving instrument. The law which tells us truly what is good and right and also what is wrong and evil was not given to us so that we might live because of it. And this is the point. The lawyer comes to Jesus looking for the wrong tool for the job. He is seeking life by keeping the law. That would be like going to a tractor supply company and trying to order Chinese food. It just, they don't do that there. They would look at you like you're a crazy person. They would say, if you want to buy a wrench, we can do that, but we can't help you with your request. And so it is for the lawyer who goes to Jesus, seeking righteousness from the law. He will not find it there. And so you and I must learn from this today. We must learn where to go for our hope for eternal life. If we place our hope for eternal life in our keeping of the law, well, then all you're going to hear from Jesus is, okay, sure, you go and do likewise. Sounds simple enough, but that is no comfort for you if you're honest with yourself. Because you know as well as I do that we haven't kept this. You certainly haven't kept it in the way that Jesus commands it. Notice how all-inclusive the Samaritan's love is. He doesn't just pour on oil and wine. He doesn't just give him the donkey to ride on. He doesn't just put him in an inn. He doesn't just write him a blank check for all of his expenses. Instead, he treats this man's life as more important than his own. That's what it means to keep the law in its fullness. And how could we, who we can't control our tongue, we can't control our emotions, we can't control our lusts, we struggle with these things, what would make us think that we could do this? That's because compassion the thing which drives the Samaritan is foreign to us. Just as foreign to us as the Samaritan was to the man beset by robbers. Compassion does not come, strictly speaking, naturally from us. It doesn't come out of our humanity. Instead, compassion is the thing which comes from God. And so where do we look? Where do we look for hope? Well, if we ask the wrong question, this parable will never give us hope. If we use the active voice, like the lawyer did, what must I do, rather than the passive voice, what must be done, then this parable offers us no hope. But if we change the way we talk, if we change the questions that we ask, and we say, what must be done for me that I might have eternal life? then this parable becomes for us a very hopeful thing. For we realize that who we are in the parable is not the Levite, the priest, or the Samaritan, but you are the man beset by robbers. You are the one who is left 
dying in your trespasses as a poor, miserable sinner. You need the compassion that Christ, the good Samaritan, gives to you. And this is ultimately what the law was given for, to reveal in us just who exactly we are, to reveal our own sin to us. Now, certainly the law of God does curb evil, and it is a most wonderful thing for the training of the Christian in righteousness, but its chief function is to show us our sin, to reveal to us that we are the man beset by robbers. It will always accuse us. So therefore, we cannot look to it for salvation. The priest and the Levite, remember, in the story, they walk by on the other side. They pass by. Now, Jesus didn't just pick these names out of a hat. They are representatives of the Old Testament Mosaic law. They cannot save you. They will not pick you up out of the ditch. They do not have that power. But at the right time, a Samaritan comes along. At the right time, compassion comes along. At the right time, mercy comes along. At the right time, Christ comes along. And so the man beset by robbers, he hears the good news that finally there is one who shows compassion, who shows him mercy. If we read the parable in this way, we find out that chiefly Christ is the good Samaritan. He is the foreigner who enters into our lives to save us. For heaven is the home of Christ, and our plight, our despair, well, really, they're not his problem. And yet, out of compassion and love, he makes our problems his problem. He makes our burdens his burdens. He makes our wounds his wounds. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so the man, the good Samaritan, gives to the man beset by robbers his own merits, his own mercy, giving him a blank check, offering him whatever more you, debts you incur, I will pay it when I return. Now, all of these images, these images of the Good Samaritan, they ultimately point you here to the crucifixion of your Lord Jesus. They all point you to the place of the skull outside of Jerusalem where a man was beset by robbers who beat him, stripped him, and left him dying upon a cross. They all point you to the fact that eternal life is not achieved by you, but it is given to you right here. And really, if we, we have a new crucifix here, and it's beautiful, but it's also hideous. It's death. It's blood. It's sweat. It's tears. There's no lavender-scented hoity-toity about it. Jesus' death was gritty, brutal and horrible, your life comes at a cost. Your eternal life was bought and paid for by every precious drop of blood that Jesus shed from his feet, from his hands, from his side, from his back, from his brow, and from his tears. As Jesus bled on the cross, he poured out oil and wine upon your sin. As Jesus bore the heat of the day from noon onward, as he hung upon the cross, he places you on his own animal. As Jesus cried out in death, he says to the Father, whatever more they spend, I will repay when I come back. And so this sight, this is your good Samaritan. So what must you do to inherit eternal life? Well, stop asking that question. We don't need to. The, pre the priest and the Levite, they pass by. They can't answer that question. We know that there is no law that can give life. Instead, we know that it is the promise. 
the promise of God given to us in Christ Jesus, which gives us life. So let us fix our eyes on the one who shows us mercy. In his name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of your dear Son and for the revelation of your will and grace. Implant your word in us that with good and honest hearts we may keep it and bring forth the fruits of faith. We humbly implore you to rule and govern your church throughout the world. Bless all those who proclaim your truth, that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, and that faith in you may be strengthened, love toward others increased, and your kingdom extended. Send forth laborers into your harvest, and sustain those whom you have sent, that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people, and the gospel preached in all the world. Grant health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially to the President and Congress of these United States, the Governor and Legislature of this state, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Grant them grace to rule according to your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty, According to your good pleasure, turn the hearts of our enemies and adversaries, that they may cease their hostilities and walk with us in meekness and in peace. Although we have deserved your righteous wrath and punishment, yet we ask you, O most merciful Father, not to remember the sins of our youth, nor our many transgressions. Out of your unspeakable goodness and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger to body and soul. Preserve us from false doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart and despair of your mercy, and from an evil death. In every time of trouble, show yourself a very present help, the Savior of all, especially to those who believe. Cause all needed fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. Give success to the Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations on land, sea, and air, and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, crowning them with your blessing. These and whatsoever other things you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you.
is truly meet, right, and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may this holy body and this precious blood strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 